and the car you you it's all yours. Okay, great. So can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So um so I'm gonna talk about, you know. Uh, so you know, the the uh, first of all, yeah, thanks to Mark and uh, to Joe for inviting me um, for this uh, presentation. And uh, Joe suggested a title for it, uh, which you would have seen. What in heck is CCL doing with the oil and gas industry? Um, I changed it to a more PG version. Uh, what on earth is uh, CCL doing with the oil and gas industry? Um, okay, and. Um, so before I before I begin on 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 the rest of the presentation, this 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 is a picture of uh, Bigfoot. Um, so it's a Chevron uh, platform uh, in operating in five thousand feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. And just to, just to say up front here, these companies have got tremendous capabilities, and um, you know we're trying to do what we can to uh, direct those, or not direct them, but slightly influence those um, towards what we think is a better uh, direction. So, um, meeting topics. Uh, why are we engaging with the oil and gas industry? Um, and, and then a little bit of background on um, the oil majors um, and their climate positioning, how they positioning their operations and their uh, strategies, really strategies and operational business plans uh, relative to the climate. And what is Team Oil doing? That's what I'm. <clears throat> that's what I'm going to cover. I'll, I'll probably take about twenty minutes. Um, I think at the most, and then, and then we can have a lot of Q&A and discussion, hopefully. Um, okay, so so you know, why engage with the oil and gas industry? Well, um, you know, you, you you may have heard you may have heard this uh, story. Um, I think it's apocryphal, but uh, um, Willie Sutton, uh, um, he's a bank robber back in the twenties or nineteen thirties, and he was asked, um, "Why do you rob banks?" And he said, "Well, that's that's where the money is." Okay, so um, why do we engage with the oil and gas industry? Um, it's because that's where the emissions are. And um, so kind of step back here and um, talking about, you know, where, where are the global greenhouse gas emissions? You know, how much are they, where are they coming from? Um, the total amount globally um, is uh, about 60 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. Okay, so that's a that's a good number to remember. Um, and um, a, gig, a gigaton, of course, is just a billion tons. A giga is just a fancy word for a billion. Um, and um, what is a you know what's a billion tons? Well, at the bottom of the slide, um, you see that a billion tons is ten thousand fully loaded aircraft carriers, and uh, that's a picture of the Gerald R. Ford, the biggest aircraft carrier the U.S. has. Take 10,000 of those, and that's 1 billion tons, and multiply that by 60, and that gets you to the total amount of CO2 emissions. So it's a it's a huge amount, obviously. Um, now, about um, two-thirds of this, um, roughly 40, is coming from fossil fuels, and that's on the, the right-hand graph here. Um, you can see coal, oil, natural gas, methane. Um, so a bunch of it is coal, is coal, and 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 then the rest of it is oil and gas, and it really breaks out about fifty fifty in the in you know in the fossil fuel area. So oil and gas industry emissions are twenty two gigatons per year. It's one third of total global emissions. And then um, you know the oil and gas majors, and I'll talk about those. Um, they're responsible for 5% of total global emissions. And that includes operations and the combustion of their products. So what they're emitting from their refineries, from their you know, gas plants, um, but then you know, most of it comes from burning um, the products, the, the gasoline, the jet fuel, and so on. Okay, so, so this is the 5% of global emissions um, that we are trying to address. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, so that's one, one big reason that's where the emissions are. Um, but then these majors, um, you know, they're also, they're also very influential and they're persuadable. So, um, um, you know, why, why are they persuadable? Well, they, they, they have a lot of concerns about how they're perceived. Um, you know, they have brand value. Um, they have active shareholders, some of them, you know, climate activists. Um, they're in the public spotlight. 
and at times there's a lot of political pressure on them. Uh, they've got a lot of external concerns. Um, they've got um, you know strategies and capabilities that would um, um, basically uh, sort of tend to drive them or enable them to to address climate change. So they have very long term outlooks. Um, you know, they, they strategic plans probably stretch out 20 years to 30 years. Um, and then they've got detailed operating plans that are nearer term. Um, but they're looking out a long way. Um, they've got a lot of technologies um, and they have the capability to decarbonize and to, tra to, and to transition their business. Um, and they've got a very strong engineering culture. Um, so, you know, and science. And so, you know, they understand what's happening. And um, and and they've got some really good capabilities to to address that, and that's why I showed the picture of um, Bigfoot just as one example. I mean, it's it's just a tremendous engineering achievement. Um, okay, and then and then their leaders, you know, in the sense of um, it's the bully pulpit that the CEOs basically have when Exxon Mobil or Chevron or any of these CEOs say something, people listen. Um, they have market power, um, so you know a lot of customers, and they can. Um, influence their customers, they, they can influence the marketplace, they can change their products, there's a lot they can do. Um, very large capital spend budgets, so they can direct where their capital is going. Um, they can change the direction of their technology. And they also invest, all of these companies invest in um, external technologies, startup companies. So, you know, they can, they're, 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 they're trying to select, you know, which ones, um, they want to invest in so so they're influencing technology direction and they influence trade organizations tremendously i mean many of these companies are um you know sitting on the boards of um organizations like api and other organizations so 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 they're, they're highly influential they've, they've got capabilities they're persuadable and and I'm calling them the one percenters. So 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 um, each one is each one is uh, responsible uh, for roughly uh, on average about one percent of global greenhouse emissions. Okay, which is which is a huge amount. Um, but they're also one percenters in the sense of they have a lot of money, uh, they can influence things, and they're concerned about their appearances. Okay, go on. Okay, um, U.S. majors. Um, so I've broken up these into into two groups: the U.S. companies and the and the European companies. Um, just to just to just to give a framework for where do they stand relative to the climate. <laughs> um, so Exxon Mobil and Chevron, um, they are actually increasing oil and gas production. Um, do they do have? Um, near and midterm goals, you know, hit, let's say going out, yeah, three to seven years or so um, for um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from their own operations. Okay, and then they have goals by 2050 to reach net zero for some or all of their own emissions. In the case of Chevron, it's about 60% of their own emissions for ExxonMobil, it's all of them. But they're saying they're gonna get to net zero for their own emissions. But the big issue is 90% of the emissions really that the companies that are associated with are coming from the burning of their products. And um, that's not, um, and they have modest goals or no goals really on those, on those products. Um, their decarbonization focus is carbon capture, hydrogen, sustainable fuels, very much around their abilities and, and the business, uh, you know, the market that they're currently in. They understand they have to change. So this is where they're focusing. Um, in climate policy advocacy, there's little transparency on specific policies that are supported. Um, they very likely advocate for subsidies like for um, carbon capture and sequestration for hydrogen. Uh, and they've been quite passive, I would say. They say they support carbon pricing, but they've been quite passive in their advocacy. Um, now, if you look at the right hand, so so basically, you know, the characterization is modest climate aspirations, Wall, uh, but Wall Street is very happy. Um, and you can see that on the right hand side, um, the, the, uh, the, the price to earnings ratio, which is the third line down in the table, uh, you can see is, is, is above eight for, for both of these companies. 
that's a measure of what the market thinks the um, future growth as, uh, opportunities for these companies. Um, so just keep that in mind. These, you know, they're they're around eight, and um, and then as an example of you know what are they actually doing in area of renewable power? It's very very little. Um, you know, the bottom line you know, basically basically zero. Um, I actually put 0 0.016 for Chevron because um, I actually specifically know uh, they do have a wind farm, which was um, part of my portfolio way back when, uh, but it's tiny. Okay. Um, so so if you look at the, the European majors now, um, Shell, Total Energies, and BP, and I'll just mention, you know, how are they different? Um well, they had, especially Shell and BP, they had goals to reduce their oil production. Um, Shell claims it's already reduced its oil production um, and now it's not going to anymore. Um, so they've kind of backed off that a bit. Um, BP had huge goals to reduce oil production. They backed off somewhat on that, but they still have significant goals to reduce it. So in that way, they're still different, quite significantly different. Um, they, you know, also want to reduce emissions from their own operations, but the 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 big difference is in the you know the third bullet on the left, the emissions from their ninety percent of their emissions, um, they have an aspiration for reaching net zero, um, for uh for all of their emissions. Okay, now there is there is of course some uh, wiggle room here, and typically what these companies say is we're going to do it together with society. You know, they're saying, well, we can't do it on our own. We can't, you know, we can't reduce gasoline emissions to zero or diesel emissions to zero or, you know, do, you know, uh, get everybody into electric vehicles or whatever it is that you're going, you're going to do. Can't do it by themselves. They need to do it with society, which makes sense, right? They need government support. They need the customers to be on board. But it, but they're putting this forward as a goal and they're saying they'll work with their customers to to get there. So that's a big that's a big difference in attitude, I would say, you know, between the European and US companies. Um, in decarbonization focus, um, you know, these companies are um uh planning or have let's let's say they are or have been planning to uh grow their renewable power generation business. Um Shell may be getting a little wishy-washy on that um, um recently. Um, but, you know, but they're doing, they're doing much more than the U S companies are their climate policy advocacy, um, a lot more experience the policies they support, um, uh, they, they, they advocate for subsidies, um, you know, I'm pretty sure. Um, and, and, uh, and they seem to have more visible active support for carbon pricing, not seem to, they do. Um, so, so, so there's some significant differences now. Um, you know, you know, these for these companies, though, you know, so they're still climate leaders, but Wall Street is quite skeptical. And um, you can see here the P to E ratios are more in the four to five range instead of being eight, you know, eight or so for for the U.S. companies. So Wall Street is skeptical around their strategies. Um, Shell and Chevron are very similar sized. Shell is worth about 200 billion. Chevron is um, uh, is 300. You can see on this previous slide. So that makes uh, that makes the CEOs of these companies, um, you know, very nervous. Okay. So, so what are we doing in Team Oil? Um, we've set up a sub team. Um, which is really focused on outward facing strategies. And um, you can see on this slide um, what they are. Um, the one that we've really been focusing on mostly is in direct industry engagement. And, um, you know, we're exchanging views with oil and gas companies. Um, and, and basically the strategy is to, is to look for common ground and then try to persuade the companies to greater action and to ask them for policy endorsements. So when, you know, when EICDA comes back, um, we'll ask them to this you know, their feedback and um, whether they would endorse it. Um, other policies that, you know, that uh, um, that uh, CCL uh, may be supporting like around permitting reform, you know, we'll see whether there's common ground there. So those kinds of, that's what we're, 
really focused on. Um, on the shareholder engagement, um, you know, I have done some of this, um, the um, uh, like asking climate related questions at shareholder me meetings. So I'll show you some examples of that. And, and um, you know, what this does is you get, you, 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 you know, if you're a shareholder and anybody can be a shareholder and you just need a few number, a few shares, you don't, you don't need a lot. Um, you can go to the meeting and you can ask a climate related question and, you know, and they'll answer it, um, you know, either in the meeting or after the meeting, they'll answer it in writing and put it on their website. At least that's what Chevron does. And so you can keep climate at the forefront in front of shareholders by doing this. Um, and then public communication. So another way of communicating, you know, so, you know, certainly, you know, we're doing the, the small meetings, you know, where we try to develop a lot of trust with the companies. But some things you may want to do more publicly where you're saying, OK, hey, you know, we're, we're we found this opportunity or, you know, thanks for doing this, but you, you need to do more or something and, and you want everyone to see you want you, you know you want the public to see shareholders to see it um because you know they are as i mentioned they're sen they're sensitive to public opinion um so so that's the that's the three strategies um so I'll tell you a little bit about we've engaged quite a bit with chevron um and one of the things chevron um, um asked us to do and and you know this this again it's it's based upon um um connect in, well, I would say you know some level of trust you know that they they, they have in us that we're going to give them um honest um uh feedback that's that's constructive they ask us to give feedback on their 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 um their climate change reports um which are listed on the top of this and they you know there's a lot of things that they're doing that are positive we mentioned those um, I'm not going to go through this in detail um, but just to give you an idea of what we've been doing. So we, you know, identified things that are positive. Um, and there's a lot of those. And, you know, this is a very challenging situation that these companies are in with these huge businesses um, that they're trying to change the direction of. So, okay, kudos for all of this. Um, and then we, you know, try to uh, also give constructive um, ideas for improvement uh, as far as climate is concerned. And um, the strategy there is basically to try to give them things that that they could actually do, you know, that would that would not be so far out of their strategy and their business plan that it would just be totally ignored. So, you know, for Chevron, the areas that we suggest that they could do more on increase their support for a price and carbon. So advocate for it more, you know, um, than they currently are. Um, so they have they have advocated it in, in Israel and in California. They're really not doing it in a in a, in a systematic way. But... On so many pending issues, and the Indian Prime Minister has made amply clear that oh, he wants everybody. To but I'll go ahead and mute. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see. So so then um, um, so that's. That's one thing that we did with Jeff. Um, and I talked about the LTEs. We, um, um, well, or, or, you know, I wrote this, this LTE um, uh, uh, about Chevron's net, when they announced their net zero emissions. So it, it, was, it got, it was published in the Houston Chronicle. And, you know, basically it was saying, you know, it's great that they're doing this, but, you know, here's what more really needs to be done. And it, and it just sort of is a, is, it makes it more makes it more public and um, uh, people you know they 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 will be um, you know it's a different way of trying to influence the company and the, the, the questions at shareholder meetings you know um, uh, in 2022 um, I asked uh, you know why isn't Chevron actively lobbying for carbon pricing in the U.S. Uh, and the uh, the CEO answered that in in the meeting. And um, or at least uh, responded, let's say I wouldn't say it was a direct, <laughs> fully, fully 100 percent direct answer, but he responded to it. And um, and then the second question. Um, um, so Chevron has goals to achieve net zero for its upstream emissions, but not its downstream. It's just a really significant gap in its metrics. And, um, you know, so I asked about that and they answered that. 
um, again, responded to it, um, didn't directly address it as in, um, uh, which, you know, but they, at least they responded to it um, online on their website. So, okay. And I've just got a couple more slides. Um, then we can have a discussion. Uh, engagements with ExxonMobil. So this has really been, um, you know, going on since 2015 before, before I was involved, but, you know, many other, many other people. I saw, you know, uh, Larry Kramer's on the call, uh, and um, uh, there's many, many ExxonMobil, um, ex ExxonMobil people, uh, Dick Pomfret, uh, others that are, that have been involved with Exxon uh, Mobil for a long time. Um, uh, so you know, this company is presented at two CCL national conferences. Um, CCL is tabled at the Exxon Mobil Spring Campus in the past. The ongoing interaction it just you know been a bit up and down uh, from what I've heard. Uh, based on how responsive Exxon Mobil has been at you know various times, um, but we're we're um, you know getting some really good engagement with them now, um, and Exxon Mobil is going to be presenting at an upcoming Team Oil special event. Uh, it's going to be broadly advertised. I'm sure all of you on the call will get um, you know uh, invitations to, to to listen to this, um, and. Um, they're going to be talking about the CCS projects in various states. Um, that, that's the focus, and um, and the and the discussion. You know, really, it ties in with CCL advocacy because CCL does support CCS technology and infrastructure. Um, we supported the Use It and Scale Acts that were secondary asks. These are acts, and I won't go into detail, but they support carbon capture and sequestration in different ways. And the IRA does as well, which CCL supported. So, so you know, the exam, these ExxonMobil projects are at least partially enabled by some of these policies. And so this is, you know, this is some of the outcome um, of things that we have in CCL actually um, helped to push forward. And, you know, these projects will reduce, C it will reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Um, so, so I think it should be an interesting discussion. Um, and, and, and then, you know, likely do some tabling at ExxonMobil next year. And again, similar to Chevron, you'll be asking for feedback and endorsement of various policies, inc including the EICDA. Okay. Um, this is my last, last slide. So Shell, um, we're going to be meeting with next week. Um, so that's the first introductory meeting with Shell. And then uh, BP and Total Energies, uh, um, we've been reaching out to. So that would that would uh, you know once we meet with those that'll round off the five majors, and then we're also we're also beginning to contact um, or at least identifying people at Baker Hughes, Schlumberger, um, th their large service companies um, to to contact them. Okay, so. Um, you know, what I wanted to just close on is and there's a lot of opportunity here to engage with the oil and gas company, and um, there's a lot more we could do. Uh, we're sort of just limited by how much time people can put into this. And so um, we're very interested in volunteers who are, in, um, you know, who, who like to, you know, there's many different aspects. So, you know, people who like to network um, so we can reach the right, right people in these companies. Um, you know, if you like to understand company strategies and then respond and try to influence them, um, you know, if you if you want to move the industry to support climate policy, that's that's really, you know, if you say bottom line, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get the industry to support climate policies um, uh, more actively than what they're currently doing. Um, you know, writing LTEs, op-eds, presentations around these oil and gas and climate topics, you know, if you'd like to do, if you'd want to do that. And, um, and then, you know, things like questions at shareholder meetings, and, the, and there may be other ideas also. So, so volunteers are very welcome. Um, oil and gas experience is, is helpful, certainly, but um, it's not critical. We've got people on the team. Um, some of them, uh, a lot of them have a lot of oil and gas experience. Um, some don't have, um, some don't, um, but they've got other experiences um, that are relevant. So um, thanks, that's, that's really 
what I wanted to say, and um, I'd be happy to uh, answer questions, have any discussion. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you, Akar, very much. Uh, are there any questions from folks in the room? Mark, I see a hand, and then you guys feel free to raise a hand online too. Mark. Hi, Wakar. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. That was very informative and a lot I didn't know. Uh, my question, I thought I heard you say that Chevron supports carbon pricing, and I was wondering if you have any specifics, what kind of carbon price, how much, those kind of details on that. Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, Chevron has not come out with specifics on you know a particular policy on on this, but um, the you know if you look in there, you look in their climate reports or you know um, press, uh, you know when when they're interviewed and so on, they will say, you know, we think carbon pricing is the best way to re reduce emissions and. You know, and they can provide a lot of detail and a lot of analysis on it. I mean, there's pages and pages in one of their climate reports on why carbon pricing is a good way to go. Um, but when it gets to specifics, like, okay, um, you know, what is the policy, specific policy you would support? Um, there's nothing public on that. And so I think, you know, we have an opportunity here to put the EICDA in front of them um, when it's reintroduced and say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, you know, what do you think, would you be able to support it? And uh, what are your concerns? So that's where we're at. Okay, and I see a hand, Jim Tucker, and then Larry, and then uh, just before they begin, Wakar, uh, Judith put in the chat, um, will you be able to share, send a link to your slides, if you share them? Uh, yeah, I actually, I've, I've shared them to, with, um, with Joe, and, and Mark has a copy, so you're, Welcome. All right, we'll get them then. Yeah, we'll you can you can put them wherever you'd like to and share them. They're probably in some of Joe's newsletter, or they'll be in next Joe's newsletter. All right, uh, Jim, and then him. Uh, yes, a um, question and and then a comment. Um, Wakar and and the larger group. Do you think that thinking in terms of scope one, scope two, scope three is useful or is it uh, just another way to greenwashing? And secondly, uh, one of the things I did, though, it's now 11 to 15 years ago at Saudi Aramco was whatever CCS was or whatever they thought it was, which I got interested in the topic. And... Um, Really, there's it's it's really a challenge. A, almost everything is pretty energy intensive already, except for some of the biological solutions. So keep that in mind uh, because a number of companies are uh, flogging that pretty heavily uh, these days. So it, unless it's direct uh, flue gas injection or something like that, uh, most of the CCS um, approaches uh, do take a lot of energy. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Jim. Good good question and comments. So um, so scope one, scope two, scope three, for, for those uh, who are not maybe familiar with those terminologies, uh, scope one, this is, this is uh, how emissions are classified. Scope one emissions are the emissions that are that a company emits from its own operations. So you've got a refinery, you know, you've got a bunch of furnaces, other things in the refinery that are um, emitting uh, CO2 emissions or other kinds of emissions. That's your scope one. You have most direct control over that. Scope two is emissions from um, energy that you're importing, that you're using. So if you're purchasing, um, you know, power and using that power, then your scope two is the energy associated with the production of that power. Uh, so someone else is producing the power, but there's emissions associated with that's just scope two. Scope three is the emissions from your product. Okay, so you're selling diesel, gasoline, jet fuel, someone else is burning it, that's your scope three. And um and 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 this is, you know, like Jim was kind of suggesting, I mean, this is this is an issue and um uh 
the scope one and scope two are more in control of the companies and they've got more significant metrics on them. The scope three, you know, US companies would just like to say, well, that's not our problem at all. Um, that's our customer's problem. And they need to take care of the scope three, our scope three. So um, I don't know if it's greenwashing, but it's just uh, it's just it's it's a it's um, it's something to just be careful of when someone says, well, I'm going to reduce my emissions to zero. What are they talking about? <laughs> is it just the scope one and two or is it also scope three? There's a big difference. Okay, and, and I'm going to just make sure we're time wise sensitive. I'm going to do Larry and then in the room, Connie, and then go to John. So, Larry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, Exxon was a member of CLC, which is a climate leadership conference, and they had a policy of similar to, to CCLs, but they started at $40 a ton, and then they ramped up at 5% a year, which means that we would overtake them two or three years down the road with our $10 a year increase in the, in the amount. But they were kicked out of CLC, and, and so we talked to them, Dick Pomfrey and I talked to them this week, and they said they still believe in carbon, in, in a price on carbon, but they are not emphasizing it. They, but they've actually lobbied for it, but they they haven't, they're not emphasizing it because I think it's too much of a stretch. So. They, they're looking at other activities to um, to emphasize, mainly CCL right now because they have a whole division set up to do CCL, and not CCL but CCS. Yeah. Okay. That's all, all right. I had thank to you, say. Larry. Uh, Connie. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation today, Akar, and, and uh, informing us, keeping us on level ground here. Um, I do have a question that crossed my mind. I was thinking, well, maybe the European national, you know, the the majors, they they have they have uh, a requirement because the European sustainability standards uh, was just issued, right? Um, how is that making it more of a requirement than just wanting to, or you know, having best best intentions here? And how is that going to affect American, uh, you know, majors, uh, oil majors? Yeah, no, great, great point. So the European Union and also European individual countries um, have got, you know, much more um, strict standards, if you like, um, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions operating in different ways. And these companies are based in Europe. And so they have to comply with that. And um, yes, so that's a huge influence, I'm sure. I think also just the the uh, the social, let's say the public um, um, attitude towards the climate is different in Europe on average, right? I mean, these are very broad statements on average. <laughs> um, and and it's probably more more towards, well, we really do need to reduce, you know, uh, the EU is a leader here, right? So we do need to re reduce our emissions. So I think all of these things are influencing these European companies. In fact, um, I mean, there's even been some speculation uh, around Shell, you know, which just moved its headquarters from um, from uh, the Netherlands to the UK, um, perhaps because it's a better environment for them in the UK. And there was actually speculation, maybe, maybe, and they looked at the US as one 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 option. <laughs> so, so you know, for the companies uh, moving, you know, if they, I mean, this is a pure speculation, you know, they, they you know, they they they're driven by a, a lot of things. Um, um, so they are driven by the environment that they're in, the laws they have to obey, um, the people that work there and their attitudes, um, but also this um, um, impetus or this requirement that they make money for their shareholders. So, so there's a lot of that factors. Thank you, Akar. And then one last question, and I see there's a chat too. But, uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it true that since the companies are never going to support anything that negatively affects their stock price, uh, then as long as they're operating in an, uh, an environment that uh, does not have a price on carbon, 
uh, then isn't it true that we're just not getting anywhere, that the only solution is back to what we know, which is the EIC at CDA. There, it's going to have to be a price on carbon, and then the rest of this stuff isn't going isn't to matter. We, they've got to be in a, an environment that uh, prices carbon appropriately. Yeah. No, that's uh, completely true, uh, John. The, um, the most... You know, the path forward, I mean, the, you know, at least in my view, I, I agree with you that the path forward that uh, is through a price on carbon, because that enables them to make money when they decarbonize. Um, if you don't have that, why, you know, they can't decarbonize. I mean, they can't they can't pour money into something. Um, I mean, yeah, they want to make as many money as they can, but they also, you know, but, but also simply they just can't pour money into things that don't make money. I mean, they got a business. So. So they got to have an environment where they can actually make money and 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 go forward. Um, now subsidies will get you there if you subsidize things enough, right? If you throw enough taxpayer dollars at it and 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 keep increasing your debt, but that's a that's a, is some limit to how far you can get. All right, on that somewhat. <laughs> thank you, John, for that. Uh, um, get the links for this meeting. You can take a picture of that and get the links. It's also in your, I'm sure it's in some newsletter. Okay, and now with no more further ado, uh, we have Connie and Nathaniel helping us with um, climate fresk. And I think the presentation is here, so I'll be your forward as you need to go forward. Uh, but the it's all yours and I think they can see you from where you are. Well, yeah. yeah, I think so. And But they'll tell us if you, they can't hear you, but go ahead and go. Sure. Okay, so can everybody hear me from there? Or... John, yes. can you hear okay? Yep. Yes. Perfect. All right, All right. so uh, thank, thank you so much for uh, having me and Connie here. Uh, thank you for making that possible. And thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm actually part of, uh, of uh, Slumberger, so if, if you need some contacts, uh, I might be able to help with that. So, and uh, besides, I'm also part of the Climate Fresk uh, organization, uh, so it's association, should I say. Uh, and what I wanted to do is to give a brief uh, presentation about it. It's going to be about 10 minutes. Uh, and I uh, hope uh, you will enjoy it and uh, be willing to participate after that. Okay. All right. So, uh, so we we do we do, let's say we we just went out of the uh, three months of the heat wave in Texas. We talked about the wildfires and uh, at the beginning, and uh, we see that we see if you look at the news, you'll see that there is like. Uh, unprecedented records of uh, droughts and heat waves and floods. Uh, and we're kind of putting all of this into one big black box that's climate change. So the, the intent of uh, Climate First is actually to try to to like go into the, the black box and try to uh, explain all the causal relationships between all the 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 main actors that's within the black box or uh, about climate change. So here are, here are kind of the objectives summed up. So it's really to raise uh, awareness of uh, the complexity uh, on climate change and provide an overview of uh, a very broad issue um, and have people understand and enable them to kind of uh, act efficiently Knowing what are the like the uh, main emissions and the most even important problems to to address, uh, it, it's an, an association that was uh, founded in France in uh, uh, twenty eighteen. That's where actually I'm, I'm from. That's uh, where the accent is from. <laughs> and uh, it started with a, a small bunch of facilitators. And now uh, we're going to look at the numbers, but we have like tens of thousands of facilitators around the world. So it's kind of a big thing now. Uh, so the, why you should do that is uh, because leaving the workshop, uh, 
you 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 will see that you actually learn something. You you'll have a good time, and uh, you 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 will. If that's what you're already doing, uh, I think, but uh, you will want to act even more uh, towards this uh, issue. So th this is a workshop that's designed for everyone, for beginners that don't know anything about climate change, but also uh, for people, for even like you, who are kind of experts uh, in the in the field and uh, want to deepen their knowledge about uh, climate change. Uh, so uh, here are some just adjectives to have a bit of a description of the workshop. Uh, it's fun. So that's actually the reason I, I joined in the first place uh, is this specific workshop is you, you have a, you have a good time. Uh, it's collaborative, so it's, it's based of, on uh, collective intelligence. So everybody participates, it's a team and you, you work on a common goal that's to understand climate change. It's very uh, visual, so lots of images. So it's it's kind of easy to remember and to keep in your mind. Uh, there is also some creativity uh, through the, because it's like cards and images and you can draw. So it's, uh, it, it is pretty simple uh, because you just need uh, a desk uh, with a pen, paper, and a deck of cards, and you can you can run a climate press. And most importantly, it's scientific, so it's, it's based on uh, the IPCC report. So you might be uh, aware of what IPCC is. Uh, I think I have a quick slide on that. Uh, uh, yeah. In terms of logistics. Uh, so as I said, you, you need to, what you need is a deck of cards, a table, paper and pens. Um, it's a three hours uh, workshop. Uh, it, it actually goes really, really fast when you are, when you are participating. Um, there, 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 there can be uh, different, uh, different teams in the room, one team per table. And uh, usually you have uh, one facilitator is gonna, who's going to handle one or two tables at the same time. So this, this is kind of the logistics of it. So three hours. Uh, let's break it down into uh, the different steps of the three hours. So you start with the so you, so you have your your card in the beginning. So the first phase is basically to uh, put the put the card on the table and think about the relationships between the different uh, different cards. That all represent uh, uh, like uh, an item of climate change. Uh, once you've done that, there is a creation uh, phase for everybody to express themselves, themselves, their uh, their emotions, and uh, uh, after that, uh, a quick recap, a week to to anchor the, the the knowledge to to uh, of what people people have uh, learned during the previous phases. And uh, last but not least, uh, a discussion so that everybody can give their thoughts, their uh, emotions, and think about ideas and how to take action uh, on, based on what they they, they learn. The agenda, IPCC. So uh, I I guess you all know, but basically a, a group of people who are uh, reading all the less latest uh, news uh, publications uh, related to climate change and making some reports. So if you never uh, went through that, I would recommend to go to the, web, to the IPCC website and read, read the synthesis uh, report, because it's like the, the the latest update of the knowledge we humans have about uh, climate change. Uh, it's, it's for the APCC. Uh, so I'm not here to make some uh, advertisement and to, to make money. Uh, it, the, the purpose of the climate change is really uh, to to touch, uh, to reach out as much people as, uh, as possible 
and to have people aware of climate change and knowledgeable about it. So it, it's a free workshop. Uh, it's uh, so unless you're trying to 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 do it in a company, that's kind of a different uh, thing. But uh, the the purpose is really to make it free and and accessible. That's what we're uh so up to now it's a so it's a very popular uh, workshop uh, in europe so up to now there were, there were more than one million people who who took part to the workshop and there is uh, about uh, 50 000 facilitators who like me are trying to organize some some workshops and uh, it's kind of uh, starting uh, slowly uh, in the in the us uh, so that's why we are we're looking to organize workshops and to have people uh, then maybe uh, try to engage and uh, become uh, facilitators. Mm. Um, so the, that's actually that's uh, how, how you do it. It's kind of the next step. If you if you like the, the three hours workshop, uh, it's actually very simple to become a facilitator. What you need to do is take a three hours uh, class just to know how to facilitate facilitate uh, learn the, the what's behind the deck of card pretty in depth and that's it then you can start facilitating uh, yep that's it thank so, you nathaniel uh i get inspired i'm just gonna stop sharing um one because when Connie introduced this to me, she said it's a game, <laughs> you know, fun, and so I love that because we all need a little bit of that. But it also sounds like it's you know community building because you've got seven to twelve, but how many you get in your workshop? But I also see it as a potential first step to getting people active as lobbyists in CCL because they they come, they learn about the issues, and they say, what can I do? And I remember listening to my first Al Gore. Uh, presentation way back and it was so depressing and I'd go away going I just want to curl up in a ball and cut and Citizens Climate Lobby has given me that like oh I can go lobby that's something I can do and so maybe it's one of those we you know on a court if you're still there I'm thinking instead of a walk and a, and a greet and meet we do a climate press yes. <laughs> anyway questions for uh, Nathaniel or Connie yeah. What is what is press? How did, how did that word come up? It's French. I, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I think the the first name was kind of a a collage was the climate collage because oh. you're you're taking uh, like a French word so you take a big uh, piece of paper and then you, you stick you, the collage is like sticking in like, French. Yeah. You stick stuff on it. Yeah, I was gonna say uh one one just add fresque. It sounds weird to us, but to Americans, but. It comes from the word fresco, and you know how you know in Italy frescoes. It's usually like a mosaic. It gives you a, a picture of everything all at once. Oh. And that's so, what the deck of cards does mm -hmm. as you lay them out. Yeah, and then in the end, you will end up with one fresco, which okay. is uh, that you can you can stick in your uh, okay. in, in in your living room. And then and then if you become a facilitator, that is there must be a cost. I mean, how do you get funded? Who's funding? There must be a cost as a facilitator to get the deck. Uh yeah. So um to, to become a facilitator, uh it's I think you I think I I pay to 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 do the training of facilitator. Yeah, it's like a ten dollars yeah, it. It's cheap. The yeah, the, the intent is really to make it as much very, uh, accessible. very accessible that so that we can reach a lot of people. Nice. So nice. yeah, it's it's not really nope, yeah. no barriers. All right, well car, I see a hand raised. Go ahead, uh, thanks, uh, Dory. Nathaniel, Nathan, Nathan, that sounds a very, um, very interesting um, game that that'll engage people. So thanks for sharing that. Um, could you could you just um, actually just uh, going back on you mentioned you're with Schlumberger and and uh, maybe could help Team Oil in that regard. Um, can I get in touch with you through the CCL um, internal messaging system? I'm, I'm not uh, part of uh, CCL, so, uh, but yeah, okay, I, I, I can find. I think I can find and put your email. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, I'll try and do that. 
Um, I don't know if I can multitask, but I'll I'll get it to you, Wakar. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, you can you can you can reach out by email or LinkedIn. And I, I can send you the the contact of a a person working in sustainability in uh, Slumberger. Uh, it's actually a uh, uh, she 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 she's actually the one who 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 made possible the fact that we organized some climate fresh in Slumberger. So she's kind of uh, open-minded person. So it's fine. kind of nice to talk to them. Oh, that's excellent, Nathaniel. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, appreciate it. Oh boy, we haven't moved enough, so all the lights are going off. Well, but well, Car, the, the key question is: Do we have you convinced to want to sign up to take a climate press workshop pretty soon? <laughs> I think that's what we want to know. We want, want you want got, to we got to do a little bit of both, right? We got getting to there, the getting the, getting there. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to get back to this Zoom meeting. I'll and do it if a car does. Oh, there you go. Okay. I mean, the, the key here is like, in order to understand what Nathaniel was talking about, you, you got to take part in it. Okay. Um, no matter how much you think you know about it, because what ended up happening, I took it for the first time um, earlier this year. And uh, it, it was, it was, it seemed long. I was like, oh, it's free. Why not? You know, I could just take an afternoon. But after I went through with it, I, I just felt like that's, I mean, I, I wanted to stay longer. I wanted to learn more. So the time does go by very fast. Um, and the thing is, no matter how much you think you know, when you go in there and you, you're piecing together the story about climate, you know, how climate's changing, um, depending on who's in your group and who's in your team, you can have some serious, you know, very a different discussion every time you take this press. Mm -hmm. So, because depending on who's who's involved, what their knowledge, um, the kind of conversations and questions you come up with. So, I, I highly recommend you, you know, everybody, everybody try this because um, in the end, you um, like Nathaniel was saying, you you try to piece together these flashcards, um, understanding the story of how climate change is occurring, and then you debrief. And as you debrief, you actually. Um, I don't know. I have this catharsis a little bit, this revelation, and it can get, it can be very emotional, you know, at, at, at the end when you debrief, because there's just a lot of, I mean, um, some one person said uh, she was angry, and um, another person was uh, saying they were disappointed, they're very sad. Um, uh, so I mean, you just get a gamut of emotions depending yeah. on yeah. on who's involved. But this is the thing is that everybody, at least you're talking about it. Like right now we just meet and we talk here, but we're not actually involved in it. Uh, Cause then in the end, we actually come up with what can you do personally as an individual to make that change? So to change you maybe your lifestyle or, you know, it could be a mental uh, mind shift, a shift in, in your attitude. I mean, if you, but everybody's changed in some manner, no right. matter how small. affected by it. Right. Yeah. I see two hands, um, and then, uh, uh, good, so we'll go to Roger first and then John. Hi, and thanks for that presentation. I caught half of it basically because I was driving, but um, and, and uh, but the question is, the, the main objective is, seems to me, is both education as well as interaction with others. Is that, am I getting it right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, the the most important. Yeah, I think you're getting it very right. The one thing is really collective intelligence, meaning that it's not a course. Uh, it's more like you're using collective intelligence to understand. So you're putting yourself together, discussing, and that's how you get it. You're you're, you're trying to solve a problem, to understand uh, understand the problem and solve it. So that's the first thing, and and. And the education comes with it, basically. There you are. Do you just, then, then with education, do it seems like the people that would do this would tend to be more, uh, you know, think we have a problem, not those that are skeptics. Is that right? Do you get skeptics that actually attend? We are skeptics. Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, like everybody's curious about climate change, so. Uh, I remember when I did the fresque in uh, Slumberger, actually, uh, I had a couple of persons who were 
very skeptical. So it's kind of uh, nice. That's actually the what I really like uh, to have people to uh, to have like completely different opinions because in the end, uh, like that, uh, there the 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 power of collective intelligence is really coming in, into into the game because uh, people are discussing and people can try to start changing their mind or or so that's really the the beauty of the game I think. And also on the flashcards themselves, you have a, a photo, a picture, and then on the back, it's it's information, it's actual scientific information based on the IPCC reports. Okay. So, um, I mean, you can debate about how something is, but but then you still have the data facts on the back of that flashcard. Um, so, so, so even if you had like uh, 12 persons who are completely uh, skeptical, they will still need still need to keep into the rails of the game and uh, follow the IPCC uh, like recommendations. So you cannot go off track. Yeah, it's based on science. I mean, okay. it's helpful. Did that thank answer, you. Roger? Did yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so it seems to me that y'all are mostly dealing here with. Uh, people's uh, knowledge, uh, you know, teaching them about uh, the climate change, uh, attitudes and getting them concerned about it. Um, but ultimately there has to be some policies that are implemented. Are there any, th those flashcards uh, must have something, some types of policies that are recommended to solve the problem. Uh, and hence, carbon, hey, carbon price, I bring that up every time I talk. And uh, is anything like a price on carbon uh, worldwide uh, brought up in these cards? Are, are, are policy recommendations pop out of the cards? Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for the for the question. So uh, um, uh, it's it's like uh, I don't know if it's part of the workshop, but uh, it's like uh, the Einstein uh, quote that say that. Uh, when you have a problem, you need to spend like 95% of your time like thinking about the problem and then just 5% to try to solve it. And it's exactly the point of that is we, we first, what we were trying to do is really to have people understand. And so this is what this workshop is gonna be. So um, if you go there in uh, with the idea that you, you want to uh, develop a new new policy to solve uh, climate change. Maybe that's not going to be the the best, but the purpose is really to educate, make people understand, and then just initiate the process of thinking about policy, discussing. So it, it's it's like the last phase is what you you're describing. The last forty five minutes is going to be exactly this discussing about uh, or oh, what policy should we do. So maybe you can recommend to to go with a, uh, a carbon price, and uh, and then hopefully this is going to trigger. Uh, uh, then there 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 are some other associations that are very good for that uh, to actually develop solutions. Uh, but usually the climate first is kind of the first step to more of the understanding side. Make sense? Yeah, I mean it's it's more of an awareness. Like I call it a game, but it, it's it's just a, a, a time to connect with other people. You can be like minded or not. It just you can be just friends. It really basically just friends or you know people you know. Just pull them in, get them to spend a few hours to talk about climate. Because oftentimes now people are saying, "Oh man, it's so hot today," you know, but they don't understand the implications. Like, why is it hot? I mean, you know, it's, this is happening more and more every year. It's getting more intense, and people are just blaming it on climate or saying it's a hot day but they don't really understand the science or what's happening and this this game this these flashcards aims to bring that awareness for right. for typical you know your typical person right so thank you and if we can't bring them to our meetings and tell them as john says every other breath uh you know put a price on carbon and if we can't we have the end roads which connie you said was yeah. like a game I was, but yeah. in, but but end roads is a tool we've all on citizens climate lobby done the levers tried to do all, all the different solutions and like no price on carbon is what we really need so we yeah. can get there but we need to bring people at whatever level they're at together in community having fun 
And and so that's the climate press. So court, you and I will work on a time when we can offer that to our membership of Citizens Climate Lobby. Maybe like yeah. That. yeah, and I'll just point out that what Dory just said is if you've got these cards and these cards uh, um, give you some understanding and so on, it'd be nice if they led you to the universal solution that seems to always come out when people are coming up with it is the price on car and so well, that's getting... really cool if you if you do the game and then there it is and instead of walking away from the game three hours later and saying well gosh and now i'm scared to death but i haven't a clue what to do about it or or at least how to bring it how to pull it off uh right. so if, if you had that Lobby, you know, CCL, uh, make sure that connection happens. En-ROADS is already out there um, as an as a online game to play. Yeah, I can I add, too, that I, I did actually do the on uh, En-ROADS game as well. I took it through uh, uh, this Allison Whitaker. She taught it. And um, it was really, really insightful because uh, uh, that carbon tax. I mean, so with that game, I, I guess you guys have, have you guys all played trained, it before? John is a trained and uh, Rose presenter. That's awesome. Yeah, because I, I I did something for the first time a few weeks ago, and uh, you know it has all these like ideas on solutions on what to do, and you kind of tweak it, and then you look at the the number of degrees that increases or decreases, and so depending on what choices you make, and this could be a policy change, you know, uh, like uh, change. let's say zero population growth. What if you go to the population box and you say, well let's say nobody has any kids, you know, like nobody or people can only have one child, you know, and even changing that and, and see, and then you see what, how it affects the temperature change of the earth. Um, it didn't really do much. Um, and I thought for sure EVs would do it, you know, like just have everybody drive an electric vehicle. No, it did not change, did not move the needle on the temperature change of the earth. Um, but like you were saying, the one thing, the biggest thing was that carbon tax. Taxing carbon, you go to the source, right? Which is fossil fuels, that the whole that whole area, that box area. And uh, you fiddle with it, like add a carbon tax, it drops it by like two degrees. Right, so you're preaching to the choir, <laughs> but the choir needs to get members into the room. Yeah, so, as soon as you say tax, and that's that's a problem, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna lose. Uh, yeah. You're gonna lose the majority of people. Yeah, we but yeah, we have different ways. I see what cars hand. I want to be respectful of that, and then we should probably wrap up this section for Joe's sake and go through the slides quickly. But car. Okay, so just to quickly answer, yes, I'm interested um, in this, and uh, we'll look for when it's scheduled. So thank you. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Lacar. And do not hesitate, uh, anyone, to share that with uh, I don't know family or friends that you think. She could benefit from it. Good. And and you're a facilitator. Are you a facilitator? Yeah. I did. Yeah. I mean, you're you're talking about taking action. After I took that climate press workshop, I was thinking, oh, I gotta I gotta become a facilitator. So I went and yeah. uh, signed up. But it took a while because there are no facilitator trainings in the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. I I actually did it online. I had to go online. Yeah. All right. Well, we have in our midst facilitator. Wow. Uh, I was just saying, I have to follow way. through. I told Wakar I would do it if he did it. So now I'll do it too. <laughs> Page down. Um, okay, so one of the actions we encourage CCL members to do is, is get on the calling campaign, call their legislators at least once a month. And we have scripts, we make it easy. And uh, we always are polite. We always say thank you. You know, it's a tradition. And so sometime between now and the next meeting, make sure you call. And if you use this link here, it'll give you a script of what to ask of your different senders and representatives. So, Mark, anything I should add to that? No, I think you covered it. All right, well then, do that. Um, and then there's a, a conference in New Orleans um, at Xavier University, and registration is now open. It's October 7th, and it's a great time. Talk about community and building is a wonderful time to be with others from our West Coast region who care and who want to do change. It's inspirational. And I believe there's money. There's some, um, uh, let me just check here. There's some funds for um, grants. Actually, we just committed 
our chapter committed five hundred dollars for grants to help. There's students gonna or someone, Jenny, gonna take the train. They're gonna experience training. Oh, okay. So, uh, but okay, that's, so good. That's, that's me. Good. We're thinking of taking a train. Yeah, I'm flying. Okay. Right. Well then, Kristen, maybe we can put it out in our um, next email. Uh, just making that offer. Yeah. Are you going to carpool with them? No, I'm going to fly, and she was looking for someone to carpool with her. All right. We'll put that. We'll keep that out there in the intention. And then on September 23rd, this is a statewide right CCL cocktails and conversations is a statewide opportunity. And isn't that, it doesn't say who it is, but isn't that um, our chronicle? Tomlinson. Yeah, thank you. Tomlinson. Chris Tomlinson. Chris. Do, can you um, mind, do you mind if I plug it? Could I, could I plug it a little bit? Yeah, Since thank I'll you, Roger, because obviously I will go for it. Yeah, but uh, I think probably most of you already know about Chris Tomlinson, but he's, a, he's, he's always the lead on the business section on weekends. He writes a couple columns a week. He's very, um, he, he's, he, he won the, um, columnist of the year at the Texas Association for Managing, Managing Editors in 2021. And uh, this is kind of, it's a big deal. So I'm, I really want to get a good turnout. And he agreed to come. He doesn't, he, he normally would charge a fee, but he's not going to do that because we didn't ask him to do a presentation. But uh, it's going to be a Q&A. Um, and he was actually, I think several people that are on this call, he came to the, um, Archdiocesan climate conference that we had last October, and uh, oh gosh, Ju Judith and Mark and I think uh, oh gosh, we had we had several people there. But he he's a tremendous speaker. It, when you get the announcement, I was supposed to get it out Friday, but I'll get it out by Monday. There's a link there to like all those 2023 columns that because he talks all typically about Texas business, politics, climate change, and government policy. Kind of the intersection of all those things and he's a tremendous writer so anyway I, just take a look at some of his columns uh if you can come up with some questions and we're also going to have our our uh, new york times quiz that uh, dr barry is going to give and then there'll be a prize for the winner of that so anyway just please consider coming in a couple of weeks Thank you, Roger. Thank you for organizing that. Connie, question? Where is it held? It's online, right? It's, oh, it's online, yeah. It's a, it's a Zoom session. It's a Zoom. Because, because again, it's statewide, right? So it's... it's, well, it's um, we're going to... We'll get people from outside the state as well. All right. But it's, a, but it's, it's third probably. coast. It, it's, no, it's, yeah, you bring, you bring your own oh, podcast. You bring you bring your own podcast. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't supply yeah. any of the... It's BYOB. <laughs> Uh, well, that's really great that you got him to attend because, yes, I read him and appreciate his views on the intersectionality, as you say. Questions for Roger? Okay, mark your calendars. It, that will be in the newsletter. That is in your newsletter. Um, okay, and now quick reports. We have, quarter, we have about 15 minutes. Quick reports from our lobby teams. This is how we work in CCL. We have different levers, and then we have different lever leaders. And... So these are the different levers, and we'll start with Judith and Ginny, um, which is really good to see, Kristen, that you're one of the new um, uh, liaisons. But go ahead, let me not steal your thunder, Judith and Ginny. So um, thanks to Ginny, um, we only have one open liaison for the Texas 09 Al Green's district. Um, Jenny has a lot of lobbying experiences and has um, located people to be liaisons that most of which are actually in district people. So um, we are planning a, a meeting probably sometime in October where we'll talk about um, our plans for December meetings with our representatives. Um, anything else? So cool. I just, I just I'm sorry, Dan Burns. Thank you for being on the call too, and and Jenny, thank you for that amazing work. And and I just want to reiterate that you don't have to be in District 09 to be a liaison. It's great if you were, but being a liaison is an excellent way to get your your boots on the ground and and get um, help us be lobbyists. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Jenny. What else? Do you have anything else on this, Jenny? 
Uh, well, I do have a quick question. So did I never did touch base with Lulu DeVore in 29. She's on here. I thought I was the interim director till we found somebody oh, in I'm district. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, that, I, um, I didn't make that change. So Jenny is I, actually I, I, Jenny is actually the rep there, and I will change it. As okay, as yeah. Well, Lulu Hold had on. gone to the. Okay. Hold on. So there I, we go. So this it was is really Jenny fast did. when I did that this morning. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I actually live in 18, but um, we're still looking for um, people in that district. And Lulu lives in 29 and had attended the D.C. lobby conference, but we've just had trouble touching base with her uh, since we've been back. Um, and I may have a contact. I may have an interim person who might be able to help out in a, Al Green's district as well, but I, I think, uh, Judith, I, I think Joe Garfunkel wants to have a a, a phone meeting this coming week about um, some yeah. of the new people. So I'm going to hold off until we talk touch base with Joe. But, um, and then I, I think too, one of the roles that many of these people could also play, I know Nat, last month we had a presentation on thanking our state legislators on the work that was done during the state legislative session. So even between um, the semi-annual meetings with our congressional delegations, there's always work to be done. Uh, of course, state lines are so different than congressional lines as yeah, we're I, discovering trying to put together state lobby teams. But I actually made a second slide if you'll go on to the next one about the state efforts that are happening. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Larry Howe and Ann Drum are leading an effort to um, do some interim work on the state level um, so, so to prepare for um, lobbying in 2025. So we're going to try and meet with representatives in 2024. Um, there's a link to a report about our first lobby effort in March. Um, the thing that you could do now is look up your state rep and see if they join the Texas Energy and Climate Caucus, which is one of the asks. And there's going to be a priority to meet with the Republican members of that caucus next year um, to develop um, an agenda. Um, the other thing that's on the state level is something that I've just been researching, and that is proposition number seven, which is um, state amendments to the Constitution. Um, what that proposition reads is, is proposing a constitutional amendment providing for the creation of a Texas Energy Fund to support the construction, maintenance, modernization, and operation of electric generating facilities. Um, it sounds like something that everybody wants, but it's actually billions of dollars for natural gas plants. And I've been um, just, I actually emailed Larry Howe and Ann Drum to find out whether there's going to be any CCL discussion about whether we want to have a stance on that. Um, it's really complex and it got a bipartisan vote. Um, it passed with a bipartisan vote um, because everybody wants to fix the grid. Um, but I think it's complicated and something worth discussing as we move forward. And it would happen, need to happen fairly fast um, because we're voting in November. Um, I, I'm just gonna leave it at that right now. And um, unless anybody else has a comment about that, um, I'm done. One thing I will say, Chris Tomlinson is going to know all about this proposition yeah. be because of his coverage, because I believe this is about uh, building a natural gas plant that they want to just sit idle. They don't even want to use it. They just want to have it as a reserve backup plant in case the grid needs it. It's it's such a waste of money uh, because they, uh, Dan Patrick has talked so much about dispatchability during the session because they're really dogging wind and solar power because they don't think it's quote dispatchable enough unquote. But um, for anybody participating in that uh, Zoom call on the 23rd, I'm sure Chris Tomlinson can shed a whole lot of light on that, on this. 
if, you know, if I could ask a favor, like that would be a real key thing for CCL to ask. If you could let me know, know in advance, because otherwise I'm just going to kind of go, uh, you know, as people raise their hands, right? But if I know that in advance, then I can say that we have some key questions, you know? So that would be a good well, example. We have some key questions. Could you please ask Chris Tomlinson about Proposition 7 and his views and how, you know, he recommends we educate further about that? Well, someone can. I'm, I'm just saying I'm the MC. I would really like someone to do that. All right. So I'll ask the question if you need somebody to ask the question. Okay, and, right. and then just just give me a heads up if you drop me an email, you know, just so I can I can plan. Okay. Thank you, Judith, and thank you for doing that research and bringing it to our attention. There's so many people getting out the vote, but very few actually take the time to educate from a climate perspective. What should we be voting on? All right. Thank you. Any questions for Judith or Ginny? Okay. Then. Seems like I want to move on. Okay, and Court, can you, are you able to type in? Yes, have y'all guys can hear me? Yep. All right, great. Um, hey team, and um, thanks for coming to the meeting. I guess um, the, what Bacar presented is is a great demonstration of what Bradcock's um, lever does, and that's reaching out to you know, business leaders and prominent leaders in the community to um, get action and, and or endorsements um, or to some sort of engagement for the um, for our department. And so, I really appreciated um, that presentation. And so, here for our um, Houston area. Um, there's been um, an initiative to try to get academics to sign an endorsement. And uh, I'm trying to do some investigating and you know, conversion of buses to lower energy use um, in the Houston area. Um, so if anyone has any suggestions on other than just emailing the uh, transport needles for those ILC. Um, I appreciate any information you might have. And then um, I'm just going to try to keep working um, or to rather re engage with our local state reps just as we prepare for our holiday gathering, which is in December. I was able to invite some last year, but it was short notice. So I'm going to jump on that. And I think all of the work that was done in March and all of the work that um, the other um, team members have discussed will hopefully help with that. And that's all I got. I'm sorry if there's car noises. No worries. Thank you, Court. And I see Jim has raised his hand. Oh, yes, Court, uh, further to your comment on the bus fleets, uh, about a month ago, the local uh, Electric Vehicle Association, you know, which is an affinity group, had a presentation by a couple of people who are volunteering. They have a, I mean, essentially it's them uh, on the school bus fleets. And apparently, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, uh, the Cypress School District is further along than any of the other local school districts and apparently has uh, a real uh, advocate or two. So that might be uh, uh, a good place to start on the school bus fleets. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, I'm going to, if it's okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Um, well, now the presentations. So, Mark, do you have any presentation, any information for us? All right. So, um, last month, Kristen and I showed up at the Candidates Environmental Forum. This was Houston City Council at large candidates. There were a lot of them. They had like eight or ten of them. Um, so, it wasn't really a tabling event. So, we tried to uh, 
um, catch people coming out of the event, actually, because everybody's hurrying to get in. And it was put on by the Houston Climate Movement. So they graciously allowed us to set up a table next to theirs. And we talked to probably around eight different people. And yeah, I think that's the first uh, tabling we've done in several months, probably since April. So we're Yay. moving forward. <laughs> Yay, glad you got out. And then uh, the other future possibility, and people may be interested in this, even just to go and see what what's happening is uh, Citizens Environmental Coalition is sponsoring a climate summit the last weekend of this month. So it's September 29th, that's a Friday, 12 to 5, and then all day Saturday. September 30th, it's going to be at U of H downtown campus. Um, if you want to put in the chat the website, people that want to register, I think it's 40 or $50. But okay. I, I did ask them if we could table, and I'm waiting on a response. And I think we sponsored. I think that's the event we sponsored. So hopefully yeah. they'll let you take Yeah, we, we're a member. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, uh, I'm with uh, Houston Peace and Justice Center, and we're a co-sponsor uh, of that event with uh, Houston CEC. Uh, get with me if you have any problems getting in touch with the CEC folks, okay? Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. All right, and I'm not good at putting links in if I don't have them. So uh, look in your news. Was it in the newsletter or where? I didn't see it. Have to get it in the next newsletter, which is not passed. So I don't know how we're going to do. Uh, okay, thank you, Mark. And um, oh, there it is. Registration. Yeah, I was going to put the link in. But... Oh, you don't have it. All right, so 29th and 30th, U of H downtown. And then Joe's not here. He does an awesome. So, if you, what Mark didn't say is if you want to help with the grassroots, he's all uh, love, he and Chris would love more people to help the table and with ideas. And Joe loves volunteers that want to write um, letters to the editor and get on social media. And I love people to help me um, welcome new members in and encourage them to find a way to make this their home for um, not only lobbying, but but helping get the word out. Um, I think we just zip through. So that we don't have all Joe's slides. That's what that's what book the back. We ended right on time because we don't have a zillion Joe's slides. Okay, Joe does an amazing job on Twitter. We get to see all that he does every but he's on vacation. So I will stop sharing and um I think, Mark, are you going to be here listening to the, there's a monthly meeting for Nationwide that happens right at noon. And so, um, you know, if you want to stay and listen to that, Mark, stay here. Otherwise, uh, do you have any parting thoughts, anybody? Otherwise, I'll wish you all a good a month till we meet again. Uh, I do. I'd like to throw out uh, here that for the last week or two, uh, I, I'm not planning on leading a uh, uh, inroads presentation, and I thought I had three of them lined up for me, and I can only think of two of them. One of them's at the regional conference in New Orleans, and the other is for Larry Howe at a state group meeting. Uh, does anybody? Did I promise to anybody else to to give them a an inroads presentation? I know I feel it sound like an idiot, but. If if you want an inroads inroads presentation from John, and you haven't didn't hear your group listed, contact him, remind him that you want that. Good. And then Charlie, were you waving goodbye or did you want up here? Hold on, Charlie says, there's the link. Thank you. There, he's now put the link for the conference in the chat. Good. And then- uh, I'm just curious. So uh, um, John, you're saying, you're saying that you're you're open to giving an En-ROADS presentation to people? And he's good, he's a professor. Tell well, people I, about en and get them signed yeah, up. So to, I, I, I'm open to do it. I, my first concern is, do I did I already promise any of you to do one? After that, uh, we, we can go to additional ones. But yes, I am. And by the way, Kristen is on here, and she gives the presentation that she does in road workshops too. All right, so Kristen, John, if you want, if you have a group and you want to do, and you've done press and you want to do a second kind of thing, then talk to the yeah. guys. Yeah, great. Oh, Thank you. Good. And now we have a cat to leave us with. We had a dog to enter us in, and now we have a kitty cat. Bye-bye, guys.
All right. Have a good week, all. Bye. 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 Bye.